Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders, politicians, each are one to one. After all these months of presidential campaigning, we continue to grapple with the substantive differences among the leading presidential candidates and which, if any of their initiatives or proposals, are likely ever to come to fruition. Here to help us assess those issues is Francis Fox Pibben, CUNY Graduate School's Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Sociology. I'm delighted to have you. Well, here I'm today. really delighted, Cheryl. <laughs> we talk to each other from time to yes, time, we but have. this is nicer. <laughs> Now, 20 years ago, you and your late husband wrote a book entitled Why Americans Don't Vote. And eight years ago, I believe it was, you wrote a book called Why Americans Still Don't Vote. Given the excitement uh, and interest in the current presidential campaign, would you write that same book now? Uh, yes, I would. But I would, I would have to set, talk about another phase in the long history of vote suppression by the political parties in the United States. Uh, this goes back, really, to the years immediately after the Civil War, when first in the South and then in the North, uh, the political parties really launched an alternative strategy to the classic strategy of political parties. The classic strategy is that political parties compete by mobilizing voters and mobilizing new voters. They want more voters in order to win office and to control government. But first in the South, the Democratic Party, and then in the North, largely the Republican Party, hit on uh, the strategy of getting rid of voters, getting rid of the voters who are likely to vote for the opposition as, in a way, a more efficient uh, competitive strategy because it kept the more discordant, the more marginal, the more troublesome voters out of the electorate. Right. And <laughs> it also defeated the opposition party. So it served both purposes. The, we all know why the Southern Democrats did that. They wanted to restore a system of near slavery uh, for black people in the South, and to do that, they had to purge blacks from the electorate because if blacks were in the electorate, they would vote against the apartheid laws of the South. If blacks were in the electorate, they would vote for the sheriff. And if they voted for the sheriff, maybe the sheriff wouldn't allow lynch mobs right. to become a regular feature of the Southern system. So they did, they introduced poll taxes, literacy tests difficult voter registration procedures. Voter registrars who administered the literacy test by asking questions like, how many bubbles in that, class of, in that glass of water? Right. Or who were never open uh, at times when black people, or even poor white people for that matter. Or sometimes uh, they just kill you or run you out of town if you actually exercise also, the right to vote. That's also um, true. So, Skipping ahead, so we know about you know those methods used in the South. Do these kinds of measures exist today, or in what form to, to discourage people do. from voting? In a way, we we don't pay enough attention to them because we take election administration for granted. Well, you know, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it has to be. We have to have a system of voter registration that creates obstacles. Uh, for new voters, and uh, we ha have to have a system of balloting uh, that uh, where, uh, you know, the lines are long, you have to wait, it's on a work day, uh, the people who administer the elections are often partisan officials. Right. Catherine Harris was right. a Republican Party <laughs> uh, operative. And uh, the Secretary of State in Ohio in 2004, a lot of people think that uh, election was stolen, too, as a result of the Ohio balloting. So, so that's one way in which we keep down the vote. But the other way has to do with what party operatives actually do on the ground. They sort of reinvent it each year. 
uh, and it interacts with the administration. So, for example, 10 states are now poised to require photo IDs uh, if the Supreme Court allows the Indiana photo ID law to get through. Well, you can be sure that when those, if those states go ahead and pass their photo ID laws, which will make it harder for poorer people who it just has to be some poorer right, people. Right. It doesn't have to be many because we have a very competitive situation in the United States. You can be sure that there will be party operatives on the ground making sure that everybody waiting online to vote knows that they have to have their photo ID. And then they'll add also, make sure you paid all your traffic tickets. That isn't true at all. Mm -hmm. And if the line <laughs> is long, they'll give out misinformation like, well, why wait online? You can come back and vote tomorrow. Well, of course you can't. People say that? Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Or they say if you're behind on your rent payments, you can get into trouble here. Also, it's intimidation. It's harassment. They send out letters, and if there's no reply to the letters, they'll make a list and they'll cage those voters at the polling place. So. The political, we, we don't recognize that we have this glorified view of American democracy in which the parties play the kind of iconic role of mobilizing the voters around candidates and issues. And keeping other people out. And we don't recognize right, how much right. they keep people. Well, there's been a, a lot of talk lately about, you know, the, the superdelegates and also this business about, you know, uh, what do you do about the votes, you know, the Florida the people who voted in Florida and in Michigan, you know, in those, um, I guess, primaries that were not authorized by the party. Um, are those examples, well, the superdelegates, is that one way that you keep the, the elections or primaries from being representative? Do you have a problem with that? Uh, yeah, well, I can remember when, in the early 1980s, when the Democratic Party invented superdelegates. And that was a reaction to the party's uh, democratization in the 1970s when they began to require a certain percentage of women delegates and a per certain percentage of minority delegates. And the uh, party leaders wanted to regain some control over the nomination. That was why they introduced superdelegates. I mean, I don't, I'm not recommending that we change it again, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that the superdelegates have a kind of democratic obligation uh, to follow the wishes of the primary voters in their states. But, you know, in the primary, the primary's closely contested. We see the contestants on both sides, I think more on the Hillary Clinton side, but nevertheless, on both sides, we see them trying to play with the rules right. in order to get an advantage. Well, I'm also saying that they play with the rules with regard to who gets to vote because the parties would like to choose the voters right. instead of the voters right. choosing the political what leaders. Sh what should they do about uh, Florida and Michigan? What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a tough one. Uh, I don't think that voters should be disenfranchised. On the other hand, the rules are the rules. Uh, maybe they should have another election. I don't know who, should, do over. Yeah. Uh, who should pay for it, but uh, disenfranchisement seems to me to be going too far. How are you feeling about the current presidential race? I love it. Do you? I love it. <laughs> I love it. The, <clears throat> I love the Democratic primary race. Uh, I think it has been wonderful. My candidate, I don't want to pretend, my candidate is Barack Obama, and I'm enthusiastic about him, but not for the reasons that most people say. You know, a lot of my friends are sort of liberals or lefties, and they say, well, I actually voted for Edwards. I liked his position on X better. Uh, well, I might have liked Edward's position on X better, too. 
But I don't think that what distinguishes Barack Obama is his enunciation of a set of policy positions, which are not that different from Hillary Clinton's policy positions. But it's more, it's more I gather, what you, his effect on the process. Or oh, it is amazing. <clears throat> it is, it's breathtaking to me. Barack Obama's candidacy is reconfiguring the electoral map in the United States. Now, I just said that there was a lot about the process which suppressed votes. Doesn't mean that people can't overcome the obstacles with enough grit and enough enthusiasm. And what Barack has shown is that he can generate the enthusiasm and the grit, uh, which has produced enormous increases in turnout among African Americans and among the young. That's really important because the American electorate, compared to other countries, it's shrunken and it's misshapen. It underrepresents the young and the poorer, and it, uh, and it underrepresents everybody in the sense that <coughs> it is, what, 55 percent in our best elections of the age eligible. Electorate. This is very low. It's very mm -hmm. low compared to other shrunken countries. and misshapen. Yes. Oh boy. Sounds like some people I know, but anyway. Um, but even you know, even if Barack Obama, this exciting candidate, gets the nomination, it still looks like it's going to be a tough race with John McCain, do you think? I think it is. Yes, I think it is. Uh, and by the way, I think one of the nastier things that Hillary has done uh, has been to say that we need a president, a leader, who is experienced in security matters to keep it safe, like John McCain and me. Uh, that is not something a Democrat should have said. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, I think that the Republicans uh, play dirty, they play hard. Uh, remember how confident we were in 2004 that a war hero like John Kerry could, at this moment in American political history, uh, defeat a uh, draft debater like George right. W. Bush, and they came after him with the lying uh, swift vote advertisements, and with, uh, remember the, what do you call those sailboats? They're not sailboats that you... Uh, oh, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the <laughs> flip-flop ads. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and it worked. And it worked. It worked. But it worked at a time when Americans still had a certain amount of enthusiasm for a strong leader of a crusade against the terrorists. Mm -hmm. I think that now we all know he's not strong, and the crusade is a big mistake. Right. Professor Francis Fox Piven and I will return after the following message. Those are uh, locusts? What? Those locusts? Yeah. I'm throwing rocks at some stuff, and next thing I know, locusts. Sounds like bad karma. You should try volunteering or walking a little old lady across the street or, you know, something good. Interesting. Stay on the universe's good side. Volunteer, vote, get involved. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy, and I'm talking with Francis Fox Pippen, CUNY's Graduate Center Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Sociology. We were talking about John McCain. What do you think of him? Well, I think he's very conservative. Uh, I think his uh, posture with regard to Iraq uh, is not informed by the relevant kind of experience. I th think it's he had a tragic experience in the Vietnam War. He was a prisoner of war. Uh, I don't think that being a prisoner of war uh, is uh, the most uh, a good qualification for being the leader of the most powerful country in the world, a country that has to be responsible for multilateral relations with many difficult countries elsewhere, many peoples elsewhere. He suffered. I'm sorry about that, and I respect him for his suffering, 
But that is not diplomatic experience. That is not international relations mm -hmm. experience. And I, so I think that's a deceptive way in which he is advertising himself. Why would Barack Obama be better? Uh, Barack Obama <coughs> would be better because he would have, he has created a new and broader electorate, one, and that makes him susceptible to pressures from more of the American people. Uh, and second, I think a uh, presidency uh, like Barack Obama's should be compared in a way to the New Deal Democratic Party that emerged in 1932. Uh, you know, FDR won election in 1932 as most of the country uh, deserted the Republicans because they had brought catastrophe uh, to the economy and therefore to our social life. And the banks were closed, industries were closed. Sort of like now. Sort of <laughs> like now. And so people broke with their traditional party allegiances and FDR won. Now, when FDR won, he ran on a platform that was kind of mushy. It wasn't much different from the Democratic platform in 24 or 28, and it wasn't much different from the Republican platform. He used a rhetoric that was encouraging. He said, you know, attack the economic royalists, but uh, not his program. However, once he won, <coughs> he generated a kind of hope. That's Obama's word, right? Hope. Kind of uh, unclear word, you might think, but he, 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 he sort of sent the message throughout the, through the country that we now had a government in Washington that would be more responsive to the needs and the aspirations of ordinary people. And that was a kind of electrifying jolt to uh, political participation, to social movements in the country. So it uh, energized the movements of the unemployed, the movements of the aged, the movements of farmers who were not able, uh, who were losing their farms because they couldn't sell their products, and eventually the movement of workers mm -hmm. beginning in 1934. And those movements interacting with FDR, because FDR was in a position where he was trying to create a new democratic voter coalition as a result of the upset of 1932. And to do that, he became more responsive to these movements. And the way to be more responsive was to introduce the reforms that we now proudly call the New Deal. Right. Those were federal emergency relief. They were mortgage relief. Uh, for people who were losing their homes and going bankrupt, old age pensions for Americans, the right to organize for workers. Though, I mean, that battery of uh, legislated, legislated policies that humanized the United States in the 20th century was due not just to FDR's election, but to the way FDR's election helped Energize Spark, all of these uh, yeah, movements. It really changed the political map. Well, right now, you know, the stock market is way down. Thousands of jobs are being lost every day. You know, there's a lot of corporate downsizing. Uh, you got the subprime mortgage crisis with people, you know, possibly losing their homes. Prices are way up. People are angry and frightened that their future security is not only in jeopardy but but gone altogether. So, what can the government do, and what should they do? Well, uh, the government can do quite a lot, the, but the government won't do quite a lot unless they have to. And that's true even if we elect a Democratic president. You know, anybody who gets to be president uh, isn't there just by herself or himself. They are in the center of a confluence of different kinds of pressures, from the organized interest groups, from the Senate, from the Congress, from the bureaucracy, 
So it's, uh, and that, anybody who's in that position is going to have to be. They're politicians, otherwise they didn't get to be president. They're going to, ha they're going to have to be responsive to the pressures that play on them. But if uh, Obama, particularly if Obama wins, the pressures are going to change because he is generating more voter participation, and I think he is also going to bring to life the social movements, which are frequently the uh, instruments of popular needs and popular dreams. What are some of those movements, you think? Well, I think now the anti-war movement is certainly such a movement. I expect to see a new union movement emerge if Barack Obama is president. Really? It's not over for the unions? It's not over for the unions. We see already that there have been some union uh, gains over the last year, and that's a reflection both of the uh, arduous efforts of organizers and also of how angry workers are about their circumstances. But imagine this same energy and talent in a situation where the National Labor Relations Board is not as anti-union as this National Labor Relations Board is, in a situation where the President of the United States hasn't tried to weaken federal unions through the creation of the Homeland Security Administration, for example. Imagine how much stronger the union movement would be if there were friends up there, or if not friends, at least people who could hear us and who wouldn't pummel us mm -hmm. in response. So you, so you think there's going to be a, a kind of sea change if Obama is I think so. elected? Yes, not, I do. It, not if John McCain is elected. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, it, it really is not good for popular politics, for the politics of ordinary people, working people, poor people, minorities, to have somebody in power who, in a way, whose political strategy is to scapegoat people at the bottom. That's, that's really bad for movements. Mm -hmm. We may get angry, we may seethe, we may grind our teeth, but it doesn't give us a sense that we can have power and therefore we should take risks. And you don't think that, that a uh, Clinton presidency would, would bring about that sea change? No, no, I think it would be better, but I don't think it would be as strong as Obama. Mm -hmm. Who, by the way, I think is a great, great orator. Uh, a demagogue, great, a demagogue on our side, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Your students at the, at the Graduate Center come from all over the world as well as the United States. Are their concerns similar? And uh, what are their concerns? Oh, my students are usually uh, working class students, lower middle class students. Uh, they do come uh, from all over the world, although they're, they're mainly from the United States. Are they? Okay. And they're mainly from New York. And uh, they are, they are, well, you might call them left populists by and large. Not every one of them. But um, their main concern, since my students are people who have ha had a hard time, who are not, they're not teenagers, they're young adults and they're beginning families and they work while they go to school, so they have a big concern with staying afloat and getting ahead themselves. But they have a kind of politics of humanism, of decency, they have a sense of responsibility toward other people who are not doing well in American society and in the world. And the part that's in the world is so important to me uh, because they pay attention to what's going on in the Middle East or in Bolivia or in Mexico. And Has that always been true of your of your No, students? no, I think, you know, it is a global world. Uh, what happens in one part of the world affects another, and uh, that's especially true on the level of economic investment and trade, and it's true of political leaders, but now it is also true of ordinary people, uh, largely as a result of the opportunities created by the Internet. 
So my students know when there is a big meeting of activists in Latin America, and they know what happens there. Some of them even go. Uh, and so I, so are, are you feeling a sense of optimism about the political landscape yeah. for the immediate future? I do, I do. I feel pessimism because I think so much harm has been done to the United States as a result of the administrations, not, uh, not only of the last eight years, I think of the last 28 years. Mm -hmm. uh, harm has been done to uh, the government programs that we had to regulate out of control right. investment, uh, harm that has been done to our programs to protect vulnerable people in our society, uh, harm that has been done to our international relations with other countries, harm that has been done to the image of the United States as a force for democracy. All over the world. The, all over the world. Harm, egregious harm, maybe ir irreversible harm, that has been done to the environment. Yeah, uh, I wish I, I'm, I'm. That's my passion, <laughs> but I'm optimistic because <laughs> I think I think don't want to end on a. Okay, we're, we're on the cusp of a period of political turmoil and struggle and movement that could bring us back to our senses. Okay, so we're going to end on that note. Um, my thanks to Professor Francis Fox Pibben for joining me today. And for the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.